Just so you guys know, if you hear noise in the background, like whistles and whatnot, it's just because my brother's watching a football game. Cowboys versus Seahawks. We like both teams, so whoever wins, yay. But still, it's like, I'm trying to do a video here, guys. Come on. Of course, I guess it could be considered musical accompaniment. I don't know. Referees' whistles are kind of musical, I guess. Of course, Charlie Puth would be able to tell us what key they're in. Freaking know it all. Greetings, one and all, and welcome back to Tom's Hit Parade. Yes, it is once again do or die time with backtracks. I've put it off till the end of the month, as has been the case usually. Uh, so it's, it's now or never. Uh, maybe in 2021, who knows, I will be able to get my act together and bring backtracks to you during the first half of the month, uh, starting regularly in January, rather than waiting till the second half of the month. So, uh, I don't know, pray for me, will you? Yes, uh, with 2020 being what it is, well, yeah, you know. You know as well as I do, right? But anyway, yes, a Backtracks is my monthly roundup of notable album anniversaries, divisible by five, with at least one Spotlight album review. So, with respect to the albums celebrating their anniversaries during September of 2020, allow me to wax eloquent and say, let's do this! 65 years ago this month, Perry Como released the album So Smooth. His first album of newly recorded songs on the 12-inch LP format, a handful of Como singles compilations had been released on LP by this time, he's accompanied for the first time by the Ray Charles Singers, who would provide backing vocals through most of the rest of his recording career. The album climbed to number 7 during its 10-week run on the Billboard chart. A few years later, when he gained popularity overseas, the album spent seven weeks in the top five of the UK albums chart, reaching a peak of number 4. The album includes Como's versions of In the Still of the Night, My Funny Valentine, I Got a Right to Sing the Blues, and I've Got the World on a String. Also released in September of 1955 was the Judy Garland album Miss Show Business. Released two days after her first TV special in which she sang live performances of many of the studio recorded songs on this album, it peaked at number five on the Billboard chart. It consists of a mixture of show tunes, standards, and vaudeville classics, including a medley of You Made Me Love You, For Me and My Gal, The Boy Next Door, and The Trolley Song, as well as Danny Boy, Happiness is a Thing Called Joe, and What Would a Judy Garland Album Be Without Her Signature Song, Over the Rainbow. Happy 60th anniversary this month to the Ray Charles album The Genius Hits the Road. Not a live album, as its title might suggest. Instead, it's a concept album of songs written about various locations around the USA. It reached number 9 on the Billboard Albums chart and includes his renditions of Moonlight in Vermont, California Here I Come, Deep in the Heart of Texas, Blue Hawaii, and it spawned his first Billboard number 1 single, Georgia On My Mind, which became one of his most well-known hits and which Rolling Stone placed at number 44 on their 2003 list of the greatest songs of all time. September of 1960 also saw the release of The Rhythms and Ballads of Broadway by Johnny Mathis. Produced by Mitch Miller, this double album enjoyed a 27-week run on the Billboard Albums chart, peaking at number 6. The ballads half of the album was arranged by Glenn Osser and featured the Gershwin tune Isn't It a Pity, I Have Dreamed from Rodgers and Hammerstein's The King and I, and the Fields McHugh song On the Sunny Side of the Street. The rhythms half of the album, arranged by Ralph Burns, featured I Could Have Danced All Night from Lerner and Lowe's My Fair Lady, the Sondheim classic Everything's Coming Up Roses, and the title track from Guys and Dolls. In September of 1965, Otis Redding released his third album, Otis Blue, Otis Redding Sing Soul. Although it didn't chart any higher than number 75 on the Billboard 200, it was Redding's first album to top the Billboard R&B chart, and it reached number 6 on the UK Albums chart. Single I've Been Loving You Too Long was the highest charting hit from the album, reaching number 2 on the Billboard R&B singles chart and number 21 on the Billboard Hot 100. Respect, a Redding original that would become a huge hit for Aretha Franklin two years later, and Satisfaction, a cover of the Rolling Stones hit, both peaked at number 4 on the Billboard R&B chart and were top 40 Hot 100 hits. The album featured Booker T and the MGs as Redding's backing band, as well as piano and co-production from Isaac Hayes. 55 years ago this month also saw the release of Animal Tracks, the third US album by The Animals. Vastly different from their UK album of the same name, it contained only two of its British counterparts' tracks. The rest of the album consists of singles and b-sides previously unreleased in the States. The single Don't Let Me Be Misunderstood, a hit for Nina Simone the year before, and We Gotta Get Out of This Place were both top 20 hits on the Billboard chart, with Don't Let Me Be Misunderstood going top 5 in Canada. Their cover of Sam Cooke's Bring It On Home To Me reached the top 40 in the US and the top 10 in Canada. All three singles were top 10 hits in Sweden, with Bring It On Home To Me reaching number 1. 
September of 1970 marks the 50th anniversary, if you can believe that, of Neil Young's third album, After the Gold Rush. It spent over a year on the Billboard 200, peaking at number 8, and a certified double platinum in the States. It reached number 7 in the UK, where it also holds double platinum certification. It climbed to number 5 in Young's native Canada, and number 1 in the Netherlands. Just one of the album's two singles, Only Love Can Break Your Heart, peaked inside the top 40 of the Billboard Hot 100 and the top 20 of the Canadian Singles Chart, but the album holds placement in the top 100 of numerous lists of the greatest albums of all time, including lists by Rolling Stone, NME, Time Magazine, Q, and The Guardian. The album includes instrumental contributions from Jack Nietzsche on piano and Nils Lofgren on guitar, and guest vocals by Graham Nash. Also released half a century ago this month was Santana's sophomore album Abraxas. It was the first Santana album to top the Billboard 200, holding on to the number one spot for six weeks and eventually going five times platinum. It also reached number one in Australia, peaked at number two in Canada, where it's certified triple platinum, number three in Norway, and number seven in the UK. Single Black Magic Woman, a cover of the Fleetwood Mac song, hit number four on both the US and Canadian singles charts and went top 20 in Australia. Their equally famous cover of Tito Puente's Oye Como Va was a top five hit in Canada and reached the top 15 of the US and Australian singles charts. As a curious trivia note, the album is mentioned in the 2009 movie A Serious Man, although that film is set in 1967, three years before the album was released. 45 years ago this month saw the release of Electric Light Orchestra's fifth album, Face the Music. It was their first top 10 album on the Billboard 200, peaking at number 8 and spending almost a year on the chart. It didn't chart in the UK, but it reached number 11 in the Netherlands, number 24 in Italy, and number 30 in Australia. It went gold in the US and Canada. Lead-off single, Evil Woman, climbed to number 10 in both the US and the UK, reached number 2 in France, number 6 in Canada, and number 8 in New Zealand. Follow-up single, Strange Magic, hit the top 10 in France, the top 20 in the US and Canada, and the top 40 of the UK chart. Jeff Lynne claims to have written the chords and melody for Evil Woman in just six minutes. Also released in September of 1975 was The Grateful Dead's eighth album, Blues for Allah. It spent 13 weeks on the Billboard 200 and was their highest charting album up to that point, reaching number 12. Not only was the material itself a change of pace for the band, trading in their blue stylings for more Middle Eastern influences, but so was the way it was developed. The songs were composed in a studio setting and would later evolve in live performances, rather than the other way around, as had been the band's usual method. The album's only charting single, The Music Never Stopped, reached number 81 on the Billboard Hot 100. Four decades ago this month, Barbara Streisand released her 22nd album, Guilty. Produced and written largely by Barry Gibb, who also appears on its cover, the album enjoys five times platinum status in the US and Canada, six times platinum certification in Australia, and went double platinum in France. It topped the album's charts in all those countries and at least nine others, including the UK, Italy, and New Zealand. The single Woman in Love was a number one hit in several countries, including the US, the UK, and Australia, and was nominated for three Grammy Awards, including Song of the Year and Record of the Year. The title track and What Kind of Fool, both duets with Barry Gibb, were top 10 hits on the Billboard Hot 100 and went top 20 in Canada, with Guilty also reaching the top 10 on the Belgian chart and the top 20 in the Netherlands, and winning a Grammy for pop vocal performance by a duo or group. The al album earned a Grammy nomination for Album of the Year. 25 years later, Streisand and Gibb would again team up to release a sequel album, Guilty Pleasures. September of 1980 also saw the UK release of Ozzy Osbourne's solo debut album, Blizzard of Oz. It barely missed the top 20 of the Billboard 200, climbing to number 21, but it was a top 10 album in the UK and Canada, reaching number 7 and number 8 on their respective charts. It currently holds five times platinum certification in the US. Crazy Train, Ozzy's best-selling and arguably most famous single, oddly wasn't his highest charting. It didn't appear on the Billboard Hot 100, but peaked at number 9 on the Mainstream Rock Tracks chart and at number 49 on the UK Singles chart. Follow-up single Mr. Crowley peaked slightly higher in the UK, but never appeared on any chart in the US. Those are the only two of Ozzy's singles thus far to achieve certification in the US, with Crazy Train going four times platinum and Mr. Crowley earning gold. Happy 35th anniversary this month to the self-titled debut album by Ready for the World. Self-produced by the group, it peaked at number 3 on the Billboard R&B Albums chart and at number 17 on the Billboard 200, and within five months it had gone platinum. Six of the album's nine tracks were released as singles, and four of them were top ten hits on the Billboard R&B Singles chart. Tonight and Deep Inside Your Love both peaked at number 6, and Digital Display reached number 4. 
but the album's biggest single and the group's biggest hit was Oh Sheila, which topped the Billboard Hot 100, the R&B singles, and the dance singles charts, as well as hitting number one on the Canadian singles chart. It was also a top 20 hit in Australia, Ireland, and the Netherlands. Digital Display just missed the top 20 of the Hot 100, peaking at number 21. Also released in September of 1985 was Starship's debut album, Knee Deep in the Hoopla. It's been just shy of a year on the Billboard 200 chart, reaching number 7, and achieving platinum certification by the RIAA. It peaked at number 15 in Canada, where it also went platinum, and at number 22 in Sweden. The album's first two singles, We Built This City and Sarah, both topped the singles charts in Canada and the US, and both went top 10 in Switzerland. We Built This City charted at number 9 in Ireland and number 12 in the UK, and Sarah reached number 15 in both Austria and Germany. Subsequent single, Tomorrow Doesn't Matter Tonight, was a top 40 hit in the US. The album track, Desperate Heart, was co-written by Michael Bolton, and Love Rusts and We Built This City were co-written by Bernie Taupin. September of 1990 saw the release of To The Extreme, the debut album by Vanilla Ice. The fastest and best-selling hip-hop album up to that time, it held the number one spot on the Billboard 200 for 16 weeks and went seven times platinum. It also topped the album chart in Canada, where it went six times platinum, and was a top ten album in eight other countries, reaching number four in the UK and Zimbabwe. The album's first single, a cover of Wild Cherry's Play That Funky Music, was a top five single in the US, a top ten hit in the UK and New Zealand, and went top 20 in Canada and Australia. Follow-up single, Ice Ice Baby, which was originally Play That Funky Music's B-side, was the first hip-hop track to reach number one on the Billboard Hot 100, and also went number one in the UK, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. David Bowie and rock band Queen originally received no royalties nor songwriting credit for Ice's sampling of Under Pressure, but were eventually compensated after they threatened legal action. Also released 30 years ago this month was Bette Midler's seventh album, Some People's Lives. Her first album in seven years, it was also her most successful, reaching number seven on the album charts in Canada and Australia, and number six in the US. It holds double platinum certifications in all three of those countries. It reached number five in the UK and number 10 in New Zealand. The album is a mixture of classic standards such as Night and Day, Spring Can Really Hang You Up the Most, and Cole Porter's Miss Otis Regrets, as well as contemporary songs including The Gift of Love, co-written by Billy Steinberg and Tom Kelly, Moonlight Dancing, originally recorded by the Pointer Sisters, and From a Distance, which became one of Bette's biggest hits, topping the adult contemporary charts in both the US and Canada, hitting number two on the Billboard Hot 100, and reaching the top ten in the UK, Australia, and New Zealand. The song also won a Grammy for Song of the Year. 25 years ago this month, the Red Hot Chili Peppers released their sixth album, One Hot Minute. Their only studio album to feature Dave Navarro, and their second to be produced by Rick Rubin, it peaked at number four during its 42-week run on the Billboard 200. It was certified platinum two months after release. It topped the album's charts in Australia, New Zealand, Finland, and Sweden, and was a top ten album in nine other countries, including number two in the UK, number three in Germany, number five in Belgium, and number six in Canada. None of the album's five singles charted on the Billboard Hot 100, but Warped, My Friends, and Aeroplane all hit the top ten of the Billboard Alternative Songs chart, with My Friends topping that chart as well as the Billboard Mainstream Rock Tracks chart. Warped was a top five hit in New Zealand, My Friends reached number 11 in Canada, and Aeroplane peaked at number 11 in the UK. September of 1995 also saw the release of Blur's fourth album, The Great Escape. It topped the album's charts in Iceland, Ireland, and in the UK, where it went triple platinum within its first year. It was a top 10 album in Japan, Norway, and Australia, but didn't climb any higher than number 150 on the Billboard 200. Lead-off single, Country House, was the band's first number one hit in the UK and Ireland, and reached the top 10 on the Swedish chart. Subsequent singles, The Universal and Charmless Man, both reached number 5 in the UK, and for their single, Stereotypes, climbed to number 7. Stereotypes and The Universal charted in the top 15 in Ireland, and Charmless Man went top 40 in Ireland, France, and Australia. Happy 20th anniversary this month to Bare Naked Ladies' fifth album, Maroon. Produced by Don Was, the album reached the top of the chart in the band's native Canada, and peaked at number 5 in the US, earning platinum certification in both countries. Pinch Me was the album's only single to chart in Canada, where it reached the top 5. In the U.S. it landed at number 15 on the Billboard Hot 100, and in New Zealand it just missed the top 40, coming in at number 41. Follow-up singles Too Little Too Late and Falling for the First Time charted in the lower half of the Billboard Hot 100, but went top 15 on the Billboard Adult Top 40 chart. 
The band had a tradition in its earlier years of going nude in the studio for the recording of one song on each album. The song in the case of this album was Humor of the Situation. Also released in September of 2000 was America Town, the sophomore album by John Androsik, better known as Five for Fighting. Despite charting no higher than number 54 on the Billboard 200, the album eventually earned platinum certification in the US. It peaked at number 20 on the Norwegian album charts, number 24 in New Zealand, and number 30 in Australia. The album's second single, Superman It's Not Easy, is Androsik's most popular hit to date, reaching number 14 on the Billboard Hot 100, topping the Billboard Adult Top 40 chart, reaching number 2 in Australia and New Zealand, and number 5 in Ireland. After Superman's success in 2001, the album's first single, Easy Tonight, was re-released in spring of 2002 and reached the top 20 of the Billboard Adult Top 40 chart and the New Zealand Singles Chart. Superman earned a Grammy nomination for Best Pop Performance by a Duo or Group with Vocals. September of 2005 saw the release of Switchfoot's fifth album, Nothing Is Sound. The follow-up to their mainstream breakthrough album, The Beautiful Letdown, it peaked at number three on the Billboard 200 and was their third consecutive album to earn gold or higher certification in the US. It reached number 25 on the Australian Albums Chart and number 31 in New Zealand. The single Stars, my favorite song of theirs and one of my favorite singles of that last decade, failed to break the top 40 of the Billboard Hot 100, but landed in the top 20 of the Billboard Adult Top 40 and Alternative Songs charts. We Are One Tonight also charted in the Billboard Adult Top 40. Switchfoot first gained fame in the Christian music scene, and this was their second consecutive album to top the Billboard Christian Albums chart. It earned a Dove Award nomination for Rock Album of the Year, and Stars earned a Dove nomination for Rock Song of the Year, and a Dove win for Short Form Music Video of the Year. Also released 15 years ago this month was Jamie Cullum's fourth album, Catching Tales. It reached the top of the Billboard Jazz Albums chart and number 49 on the Billboard 200. It peaked at number 3 in the Netherlands, number 4 in the UK, number 9 in Belgium, and number 11 in Denmark. It eventually earned gold certifications in the UK and Germany. Like his previous album, 20-something, this one featured a mix of original songs including the singles Get Your Way, Mind Trick, and Photograph, the former two of which charted in the UK and the Netherlands, and covers including the standards I Only Have Eyes For You and I'm Glad There Is You, along with renditions of the Dove's single Catch the Sun and the 60s R&B hit Our Day Will Come, originally by Ruby and the Romantics and also covered over the years by Cher, Frankie Valli, Dionne Warwick, and Amy Winehouse. Celebrating its 10th anniversary this month is Kaleidoscope Heart, the third album by Sarah Bareilles. It debuted at the top of the Billboard 200, making it her first number one album and her second to land in the top 10. It stayed on the chart for 27 weeks and eventually earned gold certification by the RIAA. It peaked at number 13 on the Canadian Albums chart. First single, King of Anything, landed in the top 40 of the Billboard Hot 100 and the New Zealand and Dutch singles charts. Follow-up single, Uncharted, reached the top 15 of the Billboard Adult Pop Songs chart, but fell just short of the Dutch top 40. The album's final single, Gonna Get Over You, made the top 40 of the Billboard Adult Pop Songs chart and was accompanied by a music video directed by Jonah Hill. Also released in September of 2010 was The Script's sophomore album Science and Faith. It topped the album's charts in the UK, Ireland, and Scotland, peaked at number 2 in Australia, number 3 in the US, and number 6 in Canada. Lead-off single, for the first time, topped the Irish singles chart, reached number 4 in the UK, and was a top 20 hit in Australia and New Zealand. Follow-up single, Nothing, just missed the UK Top 40, but climbed to number 15 in Ireland. Both singles reached the Top 20 in the Netherlands and the Top 40 in the US. Subsequent singles, If You Ever Come Back and the title track, were significantly less successful, but are probably my two favorite songs on the album. The album track, Walk Away, featuring rapper B.O.B., was originally intended to be a US-only single, but ended up not getting a single release in any country. In September of 2015, Five Finger Death Punch released their sixth album, Got Your Six. Their third consecutive album to debut and peak at number two on the Billboard 200, it reached number three on the Australian, Canadian, and Finnish album charts, and climbed to number five in Austria, Germany, Sweden, and Switzerland. In 11 months, it had earned gold certification from the RIAA. Four of its five singles were top five hits on the Billboard Mainstream Rock Tracks chart. Wash It All Away hit number one, my Nemesis reached number two, Jekyll and Hyde peaked at number three, and I Apologize came in at number four. All four of those singles also charted in the top 40 of the Billboard Rock Songs chart. Also turning five years old this month is Every Open Eye, the sophomore album by Churches. It was their first album to top the chart in their native Scotland, reached number four in Ireland and the UK, number three in Australia, and number eight on the Billboard 200, making it their first top ten album in the US. 
Leave a Trace was the most successful single from the album, their first to break the top 20 of the Canadian Rock Songs chart, and going top 20 on the Billboard Alternative Songs and Rock Songs charts. Never Ending Circles made the top 40 of the Billboard Rock Songs chart, but Clearest Blue fell short. All three songs unfortunately charted outside the top 100 in the UK and the top 40 in Scotland. Despite the unimpressive charting of the singles, the album was critically acclaimed, making the annual top 10 lists of NME, Under the Radar, and Pop Justice, and the top 40 of many other publications, including Q, Spin, Entertainment Weekly, Paste, and The Guardian. Okay, now we have arrived once again at the Spotlight Albums portion of the video, and before I get started though, if I may interject a stray little thought, I'm thinking going forward I should record the Spotlight Albums portion first. Uh, I've been recording this kind of linearly. I, I do the record the shoutouts first, then when I'm done with those I do the spotlights. But honestly, by the time I'm done with the shoutouts, my voice is starting to get weak. I'm starting to feel a little tired, a little bit drained. So I'm afraid, I hope it hasn't shown very often, but sometimes I'm afraid that I may not be giving the Spotlight Albums the enthusiasm, the freshness that they deserve uh, from you know my, my demeanor in the videos. So. Remind me to remind myself to uh, do that, try that trick uh, with the next month's video. But anyway, it's too late to, to, to do that now, obviously, but uh, so let's just go head on to, into the Spotlight Albums portion. As I said, I have two Spotlight Albums for the month of September, as I usually do. Uh, the, the second one is actually a very prominent album, one of the biggest albums, probably the biggest one that I'll do this year. Uh, so let's, we'll get to that in one in a few minutes, but the first one is... Uh, no less meaningful probably it's, it's got a lot of substance to it but it's just not as high profile as the second one it is uh tom waits and his seventh album heart attack and vine it was released in september of 1980 so it is 40 years old this month now uh, i got a friend who used to work at skips until it closed and now he works at house of records so he's he's sticking with what he knows so let's put it that way and he is he is a fantastic record store uh guy one of the best i've ever known uh, who isn't an owner of the store by anyway uh, but yeah, he reckon, um, recommended a long time ago before Skips closed, he suggested that I might like Tom Waits, and uh, I, but I just never took him up on the offer uh, until now. I decided, I, you know, now that there's, uh, he's got, he actually had two albums. Tom Waits had two albums that were eligible for spotlights this month. Uh, the other one was released in either September of 90 or September of 85. I can't remember which. Uh, but this was the only one of the two that I could find. So what do I think of my first exposure to Tom Waits? Uh, well... His voice definitely takes some getting used to. Let's put it that way. Um, it's very, very gravelly, very rough, uh, even even rougher than late stage Bob Dylan. I mean, you know, and we know how rough and tumbled his voice is, how worn out, well, not worn out, but just how gravelly his voice is. Tom Waits is even more to that extreme. And you know how I like idiosyncratic voices? The, you know, gravelly and rough is one of the idiosyncrasies that I'm not terribly fond of. So. That kind of holds me back from really liking this album, uh, although the instrumentation is fantastic on this album. Just the the arrangements and the instrumental talent on this album is just first rate. It's just fantastic. That really speaks to uh, what a, a reputation and a, an enduring uh, uh, legacy or career that Tom Waits has had. Uh, an, another thing that's holding me back on this album is it's it's on the depressing side. It's kind of a bluesy album. It's very very blues uh, related. That's the mood of it. And uh, there are lots of references in the lyrics to alcohol, drugs, prostitu prostitution, the seedy underbelly of society, so to speak. So, uh, you know, and that, that kind of stuff, I can't really relate to it much. I, it's just not very appealing to me. But I'm not going to give up on this album. I've only listened to it uh, twice. I intend to listen to it some more. Uh, so, yeah, it, I'm hoping that maybe it will reveal its charms to me. And that's one thing that Ian actually pointed out, was that he didn't get into Tom Waits until he was in his 30s. So, you know... It's probably an artist that will grow on you. I'm, I'm sure it will. I'm sure it is. Um, but one of the things that's kind of cool about the lyrics, and I don't know if it was intentional on Tom Waits's part, but the color red seems to be a recurring theme throughout the lyrics. In fact, one of the song's titles is Ruby's Arms. Ruby is a shade of red. But in, oh, four or five of the other songs, you hear him uh, mention uh, different shades of red. And so I don't know if that's, you know, intentional, as I said, on his part, but... Uh, kind of adds to the mystique of the album, I guess you'd say. And, uh, and I mentioned the instrumentation, instrumentation on the album. Jersey Girl is a song on here. It's the last song on side one. It's track five on the album. The instrumentation is a particular highlight of that song. That's one of the big draws for me with that song. But uh, two of the other songs stand out for me on this album. 
downtown is it has kind of a bluesy feel like most of the rest of the album and it is depressing but it's a bit more of a smooth song uh, whereas you know some of the other songs are, are more kind of like the rough kind of blues uh, so that one's a standout for me and mr siegel is also another uh, great song it's the next to last track off the album uh, for one thing the piano gives it kind of a new orleans jazz kind of feel and uh, the chorus has some of the best lyrics on the entire album uh, the chorus goes you got to tell me brave captain why are the wicked so strong how do the angels get to sleep when the devil leaves his porch light on and then that's just one of the uh, points of lyrics that uh, you know that's one of them that revealed its uh interesting take to me right off the bat so as i said i'm sure that in subsequent listens of this album uh, more of the lyrical charms or, or, or intricacies will bring themselves. So uh, I'm not sure if this is uh, compelling me to delve any deeper into Tom Waits' discography. Uh, if any of you out there are fans of Tom Waits and, there, and he has any more upbeat albums that you think I might enjoy, let me know down in the comments, please. Uh, I'd, I'd love to know. Uh, because, yeah, it's, it's hard to judge an artist on your first album exposure, exposure to them. So, yeah, but uh, it, was, it was interesting. It's not going to end up in my favorites list of Spotlight albums for this year, i got to say. Uh, you know, barring any extraordinary enlightenment in repeated listens in the next uh, in the coming weeks. But uh, still, I, I think it was worth picking up just, just because I needed to expose myself to Tom Waits' uh, music at some point. So uh, uh, thank you, Ian, for, let me, for informing me of him. And uh, I... Yeah, I might check him out. Yeah, let me know, guys, down in the comments if you have any particularly favorite Tom Waits albums that are not quite as uh, depressing as this one. <laughs> okay, guys, now that that one's out of the way, here we are with The Big Finish. Uh, this one is the one you've been waiting for, the whopper of all Spotlight albums, well, almost. Uh, the, the granddaddy of them all, the big kahuna, if you will. Uh, this one turns 45 years old this month. It was released in September of 1975. It is... Wish You Were Here by Pink Floyd. Yes, its reputation precedes it. It uh, needs no introduction. It was number one in the US, the UK, yada yada. I could spout all sorts of statistics, but uh, you guys know about this album. It is a, a big one. And honestly, I almost didn't do this album. I almost didn't pick this album for the spotlight this month uh, for a couple of reasons, for, for some good reasons here. Uh, honestly, I was afraid to take on a Pink Floyd album with what it all comes down to is I was afraid. Uh, kind of like with David Bowie, uh, Pink Floyd is an artist that intimidates me. I mean, I, I'm not going to lie. Uh, their their reputation, their legendary stature in the music world, uh, and one of the reasons why I say I'm afraid to listen to a Pink Floyd or David Bowie album is I'm just afraid that once I listen to it, I'm not going to be, you know, wowed or overwhelmed or amazed by it. I'm just going to, it's going to feel like I'm missing something that everybody else has been, has been listening to it, that everybody else has heard. Uh, but honestly, this one, uh, my good friend Noah convinced me to give this one a try. He's a big Pink Floyd fan, and this is one of his uh, top favorite Pink Floyd albums and one of their most accessible albums, in his opinion. And so I listened to him, I took his advice, I went ahead and gave it a try, and I am so glad I did. This is a fantastic album, I, from, from top to bottom. Uh, the instrumentation, for one thing, is just absolutely stunning from top to bottom, from front to back. Uh, and it's one reason why Pink Floyd is so deserving of their reputation. It's just, you know, just astonishing instrumentation. Um, the album is bookended by two long, mostly instrumental suites called Shine On You Crazy Diamond uh, parts, one through five and, and six through nine or something like that. Uh, so an excellent, just an epic uh, opening and closing for the album. And one thing about this album that I decided to do was uh, I decided not to read up on the lyrical content, what the lyrics actually mean, until after I listened to the album. Because I was kind of curious to see if, um, if I had any different takes on what the album's lyrics actually meant. And I did. And I was kind of interesting the, the conclusions I came up with, so to speak. Uh, Shine On, first of all, is uh, in reality is about Sid Barrett and his mental breakdown after the album before this, or maybe earlier in Pink Floyd's career. I'm not well versed in Pink Floyd, totally uh, disclosure there. Uh, but what I took from the lyrics was as basically an encouragement to people, you know, just to everyday people, to forget the naysayers, the critics, and just embrace their flaws and just go out and, you know, not be afraid and, and shine on you, Crazy Diamond. It's basically what I took from that. It's, that that's kind of a, I think a variation on that has kind of become a, a trope of, uh, you know, self-empowerment and living uh, life in the 21st century. 
Uh, then we have a song called Welcome to the Machine, which uh, is actually a critique on the music business, much like the follow-up track after that, Have a Cigar, and the lyrics for Have a Cigar were pretty much... Uh, you could only translate those one way. That was definitely an indictment of the music industry. But that's not how I took Welcome to the Machine. When I first heard Welcome to the Machine, I was interpreting it as welcoming a boy into a conformist society, and also, but it's at the same time, encouraging him to be re rebellious, almost as though that is an expected part of conformity. So if you, if you understand my meaning here. So yeah, it's kind of a, a double meaning song, but that's what I took the lyrics as, as meaning. And then last but not least, the title track, Wish You Were Here, uh, that was also about experience that was that were personal to Roger Waters and Sid Barrett. But to me, the lyrics read like uh, one friend lamenting a changing worldview of another friend that he'd grown up with and, you know, wishes he were here to see things from his point of view. That's, that's how I interpreted the lyrics, and, and uh, that's one of the beauteous, beauty things about music. Beauteous? Beautiful things about music. I'm getting tired here. It's been a long video. Uh, one of the beautiful things about music is that, uh, you know, you can interpret the lyrics in, in several different ways. So, yeah, that was very interesting, And but this album, you know, just no matter how you interpret the lyrics, this was a remarkable album, a fantastic album, and I am definitely... Uh, very strongly considering checking out more Pink Floyd, probably with guidance from Noah, but uh, this was a fantastic way to start. I mean, I listened to Dark Side of the Moon. I actually had that on CD. I picked it up as a freebie, uh, and I, I liked it, but, you know, again, as I pointed out with my fear of Pink Floyd was that it didn't really wow me, but this one, this is the first Pink Floyd album that really has wowed me, that's really made me recognize the that that Pink Floyd has has the reputa reputation that they deserve uh, in the history of music. Yeah, um, I, I kind of, in some ways, I kind of wish I would listened to this album five or ten years ago. But in another way, maybe I'm glad I didn't, because one of the things that I've noticed about music as I grow older is sometimes when you're younger, you're not ready for certain albums, and they don't strike you until you're older in your in your life. So, uh, yeah. That, that's kind of the way I, I think Pink Floyd kind of came along or this album came along for me at just about the right time. Maybe a couple of years I would probably have, uh, a couple of years ago I probably would have enjoyed it as much as I do now. But yeah, a fantastic, stunningly gorgeous, beautiful, remarkable album. And there are going to have to be some uh, amazingly good albums over the next three months for this one to not be at least number two, quite possibly number one, on my list of my Backtrack Spotlight albums for the year of 2020. But anyway, to avoid going on any longer and gushing about Pink Floyd and wish you were here for so much longer, as, as I easily could, that'll do it for Backtracks for the month of September 2020. I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, hit that like button and share it with your friends, and give me your thoughts, questions, suggestions, or constructive criticisms in the comment section below. Also, scroll down to the description for the link to my Twitter and Instagram feeds, and links to my favorite fellow YouTubers who are all worth checking out. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel and browse my past videos, and be sure to ring that notifications bell so you'll be the first to know each time I drop a new video. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time, and remember, life's too short to be a music snob.